Cubans to get a new president and it won't be a Castro, Raul stepping down after he and brother Fidel ruled for almost 60 years. But is it the end of the Castro era and will it mean a change in politics for this island nation? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I am Hashim Ahalbara. The Castro brothers Fidel and Raul have between them been in power in Cuba for almost 60 years. But is the family era coming to an end? More than 8 million people were eligible to vote for a new national assembly, which will then be tasked with electing a new president in April. And this time, the president's name won't be Castro. Raul stepping down after serving his second five-year term. Cuba's new leader is likely to be someone who did not fight in the 1959 revolution, with current Vice President Miguel Diaz-Canel favorite for the job. And it won't be an easy one with the country's economy on the slide and relations with the United States of America worsening since Donald Trump became president. Cuba has been a communist one-party state led by the Castro brothers since 1959. That's when Fidel and Raul led the Cuban revolution and overthrew the government of US-backed Fulgencio Batista. In 1961, the US launched the Bay of Pigs invasion, a failed attempt to remove Castro from power. Fidel allied himself and Cuba more closely within the Soviet Union. But when it collapsed in 1991, Cuba was plunged into an economic crisis. In 2008, Raul took over from his brother who was suffering ill health. Fidel died two years ago, aged 90. In 2014, 50 years after severing ties with Cuba, the US agreed to normalize diplomatic relations and Barack Obama became the first US president to visit in 88 years. But things have been different under Trump. Let's bring in our panel. Joining us from Washington, D.C., Peter Hakim, President Emeritus of the Inter-American Dialogue, a Washington-based think tank from Havana, Carlos Alzugaray, Cuba's former ambassador to the European Union, and also in Washington, Larry Burns, Director of the Council on Hemispheric Affairs. Welcome to you all. I would like to start by asking Mr. Alzugaray this. Do you believe that we are witnessing a genuine power shift in Cuba? I, I would call it a generational transition of power, which doesn't mean a break with the past. It is, uh, of course, it is continuity and change. I think the most important changes that have been taking place in Cuba over the last eight years, eight, ten years, under Raul Castro will be the benchmark from which we would have to judge the future. And as a matter of fact, when uh, Raul Castro took over from Fidel Castro, he started the process of adaptation of the economic model and the political model to uh, an era where uh, the politics uh, and the way of doing politics and doing government that his brother Fidel had carried out um, will change. How are they changing? They're changing basically to a more institutionalized mm -hmm. for, for formation, more a consensus type of government, and uh, economically a shift to a mixed economy. Okay. Uh, the, the economy up to uh, the, the early 90s was basically a state-owned economy. Now we're going to a mixed economy. We will economy. talk more in detail about those aspects. Uh, uh, Mr. Hakim, we're talking about is this a genuine institutional change, as Mr. Alzugaray has been saying, or just a window dressing? Because ultimately, Raul remains the leader of the Communist Party and the chief of the armed forces. Will he retain ultimate say in the country? Well, well I think the one big question is, is it a change in the name of the president, or does the new president have real power or not? Is it a change in who runs the country? And if the new president is supposed to exercise power, 
where is that power supposed to come from? Mm -hmm. He doesn't have the name of Castro. Where does his power come from? He, it's disgraceful that there's been no consultation with the Cuban people about who might take over this, uh, uh, the leadership. And so one gets to the question of what kind of power, how is he going to exercise power on the whole, dictatorial regimes, one-party regimes are not very good at transferring power. Mr. Burns, they may be good at moving mm -hmm. one other person or another into positions, but to actually transfer power is often a very critical uh, change. Mr. Burns, it might be early to decide whether this is going to be the beginning of the end for the era of Raul Castro, but however, we're talking about an extremely delicate moment. How do you see Cuba tomorrow without Raul Castro? Uh, I think that um, there's no question that the Castro legacy is significant and is not going to appear, disappear. At the same time, it also should be noticed that during the many years of the Castro governance, uh, people suffered. There was f shortages of food, uncertainties of land titles, a whole series of nettlesome problems that bedeviled the lives of the average Cuban. At the same time, at the same time, there was a good deal of, of respect, largely driven by uh, populism, uh, that uh, Castro stood up to so many American presidents, and uh, there was a certain sense of pride in this. Yeah. Well, um, it was assumed that when uh, President Trump came in that uh, there would be a significant shift which had been pioneered by President Obama. But un unfortunately, at least for Latin America, rather than um, see a, a shift, one saw a kind of abrupt ruptures and that uh, Secretary of State Tillerson turned out to be not the bright star in the firmament, but uh, a uh, very modest adaptation to what had existed before. Mm -hmm. And what had existed before was a policy that was a dead-end policy. Okay. It had no class. Mr. Mr. al Segarai, we're talking about the departure of Raul Castro if it happens. This is someone who made significant impact on Cuba, both politically and economically. Do you think that his legacy will continue or that whoever takes over is going to chart a new course for Cuba? I think there are two legacies that are going to remain in place. One is the will of the Cuban people, which uh, Fidel Castro materialized and even expanded, which is independence from the United States and a participation in the international system with its own uh, profile. This is something that the Cuban people aspire to and will, it will continue certainly after uh, Fidel and Raul Castro. And secondly, is the question of social justice. These are these two, the two main uh, premises on which the Cuban revolution is based. At the same time, uh, Raul Castro had, had to introduce economic reforms to make the system more efficient so that the, the uh, social achievements can be maintained. And this is probably the most important challenge that the new president will have. Finally, you will have to start working on the constitution and the electoral system to produce one constitution and one electoral system that is more adapted to the new realities of Cuba mm -hmm. and the changes that have happened in Cuban society, in great part uh, because of the revolution. Very interesting to hear that coming from you. You've, you've, you've served in the past as a former ambassador to the EU. Mr. Hakim, now, Raul has been known for sort of let's put it this way, softening the rigid Marxist-Leninist interpretation to politics and economy, particularly when it comes to economic reforms. Will those reforms survive or do you see them part of an old chapter? Let me say, 
Carlos, uh, of course, is in Cuba. He has a much closer view of the events uh, from afar. My sense is that Raul Castro really has had a failed regime over the past 10 years, that he really hasn't accomplished anywhere near what he had to accomplish to assure Cuba's uh, uh, relatively decent future. Uh, he had the opportunity uh, to make economic changes over a de decade. And those economic changes have been very slow, very minimal. Still, Cuba is not a very attractive place for foreign investment. It's not become the tourist uh, center that it should have become. Uh, it's still a very poor country dependent on U.S. remittances, on uh, Venezuela transfers. Mm -hmm. The economy is really on the verge of a terrible crisis in Cuba, unless there are sh serious, deep reforms made. Secondly is the political opening has been very, very restricted. Sure, there is now Wi-Fi in Cuba, more people are involved, more people are informed. There is somewhat more of an open debate on many issues. But the threat of repression, the threat of jail, the threat of beatings is still very, very much present. And lastly, the fact is that, you know, they're going to select a new leader. And we don't know what the source of his power is going to be. And the people of Cuba have had no say in the outcome. Mm -hmm. Mr. Burns, speaking of the new leader who's going to take over, many suggest that it could be Miguel Diaz-Canel. Is he more likely to be a hardliner or someone who has to ultimately take into account that the world is a different place now and therefore he needs to change for the country to move forward? Well, um, I listened carefully to uh, Peter's analysis of... Uh, Cuba under the Castros, I probably would have a different uh, interpretation that um, what has taken place in Latin America, in uh, Cuba, the changes are real, they're substantive, in many respects they're remarkable. They are, if you go back uh, several generations, you'll discover that the reforms that have made under uh, Raul uh, were precisely the kinds of reforms that were called for at the beginning of the Cuban Revolution, and that the, the changes have been significant and could, could be built upon. But unfortunately, that's not even the issue. The real issue is, um, is the United States waging an ideological war against Cuba, or is it interested in general reforms? Now, the various uh, uh, initiatives that Cuba has undertaken mm -hmm. to uh, attempt to uh, uh, develop a more substantive relations with the United States, they've been, uh, in the beginning, they were sniffed at by the, the State Department. Now, the State Department is totally uh, against these reforms, and in fact, uh, uh, it now has come forth with a new, and I might say preposterous notion that uh, the Cubans are using some kind of nerve gas to uh, wound American diplomats stationed in Cuba. Mm -hmm. And the question is, you want to ask, why would Cuba do this? I mean, Cuba wants relations with the United States. It has sought relations with the United States. And um, also, a a reform relationship with Cuba, with the United States, okay. is so, imperative if the United States is to restructure its Latin American policy. Mr. al Segarai, it seems that Raul built his calculations on the assumption that if he starts the reforms, normalizes ties with the United States of America, that would trigger more foreign investments, more cash into the country, booming uh, tourism. However, two things have changed recently. First of all, the U.S.
seems to be reversing the rapprochement with, uh, uh, that has been started under Obama. Second, Venezuela, which was the main financial backer for Cuba, is no longer providing significant assistance. Where does this live, li leave Cuba? Let me start by correcting two things that Peter said. Experts have been predicting the collapse of the Cuban economy for years. Mm -hmm. And here I am again witnessing a new prediction. That hasn't happened, so I don't think it will happen. Secondly, yes, uh, Cubans participated in this electoral process. As a matter of fact, half the members of the National Assembly that is going to be elected today are original proposals from the people. So we have had a say uh, on this. Now, on relations with the United States, I think the bet that Raul has done is let's start making a normalization of relations So because it benefits Cuba economically. Now, does Cuba depend on Venezuela? Come on, Cuba now has its external economic partners are very wide group of China, which is the most important right now, Venezuela, yes, Canada, which is the main tourist market, uh, Europe, a number of countries in Europe are in, uh, invested from a number of countries in Euros are in Cuba. Recently, the, the head of the foreign policy um, authority in, in the European Union visited Cuba and uh, promised uh, support of the European Union on a number of issues. So Cuba right now is more independent than ever before in economic terms. We don't have a main partner that would have that its, its disappearance will cause the Cuban economy uh, a major problem. Mm -hmm. So Cuba is moving and, and Raul Castro has done what he could do. I think, I think one thing that sometimes is lost in the debate is that Raul has tried to rule on a consensus base. And there is a problem with creating a consensus when you are really democratic. But then you it's need very to, difficult, to Mr. Talk to a lot of people. You need I'll to bring right. everyone together. And some reforms. You've been using the term consensus many times. It's very difficult to gauge this sense of a consensus in an, a system which is not based on pluralism. It's just about one political party that dictates its own terms. And people are not elected, they are selected in a way or another. But, but, you know, the, the three or four main documents that have been approved over the last few years that are the main documents that design where the country is going were discussed with every, everyone. I, part, I myself participated in the discussion. The documents were the result of a long process of about a year of discussions, deliberations and debates among Cubans. How can you say that there is no democracy in Cuba, you want something more democratic? Tell me about one country where the three or four main documents that point out where the country is going has been discussed with the people and by the people. Come on. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's this okay. kind of repetition of this vision of Cuba that is not really the vision of Cuba. I see your point. Mr. Hakim, we're talking about Miguel Diaz Canel, who is the vice president, potentially becoming uh, president. This is not someone who has fought in the Revolutionary War in 1959. Is he able, if he becomes elected, to fill in the shoes of someone like Raul Castro? Well, let me first uh, say that I uh, very much hope uh, Carlos Alcigaray is right about the changes that have been introduced and the possibility of building on those changes for improving the Cuban economy mm -hmm. and opening its politics and opening its society far more than it is today. Uh, my own view is that I, you know, when you stop, uh, when you don't reform more quickly enough, the reforms get bogged down. They make it very, very difficult to keep going. They're not a very effective platform. And frankly, I've heard the story about reforms, a new private sector in Cuba for the past 10 years. And it's been held back. Cuba is, it's true that the relations with the United States have taken a turn for the worst. I think it's a mistake. I agree with Larry on that point. On the other hand, uh, Cuba has not taken advantage of the potential of a new relationship with the United States. They wasted the last period 
from 2000. Yeah, but they were not given a chance in a way or another. They were not given a chance. The normalization started when Barack at, Obama was in power. Yeah, but then suddenly with Trump, everything is being reversed. We're not we're not being fair to the Cubans in a way or another when it comes to this particular notion. Go ahead, go ahead, Mr. El Segurai. The embargo is, is still in place. Obama couldn't uh, lift the embargo. Come on. Okay. Mr. Mr. Burns, I would like to ask you this question. We're talking about the establishment stands the same. We're talking about someone who's taken over from Raul Castro. It could be Vice President uh, Miguel Diaz-Canel. If the, if the system does not change, do you expect a, a change in style or a genuine change in substance? The face of Cuba won't be the same under whoever takes over. You know, it'd be very nice if the some of the uh, zealots who who feel that um, Cuba is lagging when it comes to reforms, uh, it, they have had no problems in uh, extending the most cordial relations with a brutal society like Honduras, whose human rights violations far transcend anything that takes place in um, uh, Cuba. Um, also, we, we have the, the whole notion of um, what do we want out of a relationship with, with Cuba? The Cubans have are rapidly been privatizing their economy. Uh, the number of, uh, of, uh, state sec uh, of state sector jobs has grown significantly. Um, the, uh, there's a, a, a sense of vitality that exists there that didn't exist before. Uh, reforms that are taking place in Cuba are real. And uh, I don't know what you, whether you, you want to weigh these reforms, or you want to assess them, but they're real, they exist. Uh, you see it when you go to Cuba in private homes being renovated and, and, and restaurants opening up and, um, and uh, unfortunately, uh, the U.S. policy towards Cuba is not a foreign policy. It's a domestic political policy. I see your point. It's a policy that's aimed. It's a policy that's aimed at uh, at, uh, at at weakening Cuba rather Under, than okay. de developing a a reasonable relationship. Mr. Al Segarai, I would like to hear this from. Uh, uh, you, uh, Fidel Castro has been talking about the ultimate dream of the revolution, which is an egalitarian system. Uh, Raul followed in his footsteps. Do you see that human rights, reform of the constitution, multi-party system, democracy, giving bigger voice to the opposition, that could be potentially the biggest challenge facing the new leadership of Cuba? Um, you know, talking about the opposition in Cuba is kind of difficult because when most people talk about the opposition, they usually, uh, they usually refer to small groups of dissidents that have no influence. There is a more important opposition in Cuba, the opposition that, for example, I make, which is criticize the government, say what the government should do, etc. And I think some of us do it in a more effective way than pandering to the foreign media so the foreign media notices what we say. Uh, so um, I think uh, don't underestimate Miguel Diaz-Canel for one minute. This guy has been uh, in the Cuban political system for many years. When he arrived in Las Villas, in Santa Clara, to be the first secretary of the party in Santa Clara, he did reforms in Santa Clara. Now, he has been there all the time. He is effective. He is well organized. He listens to people. So uh, don't underestimate him. I think he's going to be a good president. I okay. think that if you compare his trajectory with the trajectory of many presidents in Latin America, he comes out very well. He comes out well, very well prepared for the you. job. We'll have to leave it uh, on that note. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. So Carlos Altsegaray, Peter Hakim, Larry Burns, thank you very much indeed for your contribution to this program. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Hashem Ahmad, and the whole team here. Bye for now.